Hello everyone and welcome to today's video where we would be discussing the CA final financial reporting RTP of May 2023. Now this has two parts. First there are a few amendments linked to CSR and then repeat a reprint of the amendments which were given in November 2022 for which we have shared a video earlier as well. The CSR import amendments are again largely linked to law and not very important from an accounting perspective though we will discuss them at the end of the video. So let us go into the questions. There are a few interesting questions over here specifically linked to business combination, then linked to borrowing cost, EPS. Nevertheless, we'll discuss each of them. So let us get started. It will be great if you have gone through the questions once. If required, you can even refer to the relevant question where you have an issue from the timestamps which are given below. So let us get started. The first question is on index 110 or 103 as the case. Maybe this is a repeat of the question that had come in GFRS Jan 2021. So let us go through this. We'll mark this as important as well. So there is a company High Speed Limited which manufactures and sells cars. The company wants to foray into the two-wheeler business and therefore acquires a 30% interest in quick bites. Now a 30% interest is a significant influence and hence there is an associate relationship. For rupees 5 lakhs on 1st of November 2011 and an additional 25% stake as on 1st of January 2012. So this is around two months later, an additional 25% stake is given, which shows acquisition of control. So you now hold a 30 plus 25, that is equal to 55% stake. Four rupees, five lakhs at its fair value. So in this case, the concept of index 103, which says that at the date when control is acquired, you will take over all assets and liabilities at fair value. So over here, the company High Speed Limited, let's say HSL, is acquiring first a 30% stake on 1st November 2011 and then another 25% stake on 1st January 2012. So it has around a 55% stake and it acquires control on 1st of January 2012. So all assets and liabilities of the selling company that is Quick Bytes Limited, let's say QBL, will be taken over on 1st of January 2012 at their fair value. At the same time, the existing investment will have to be remeasured at the fair value and difference, if any, will usually go into the profit and loss account. Following is the balance sheet of Quick Bytes Limited as on 1st of January 2012. This is the balance sheet of Quick Bytes Limited. So this is like the selling company, ESCO. So this is like the target company, share capital reserves, trade payables, plant, investment in bonds, trade receivables, standard balance sheet. And Quick Bytes Limited sells motorcycles under the brand name Superstart, which has a fair value of 350000 as on 1st of January 2012. Now, if you see the balance sheet of Quick Bytes, you don't see a separate brand name appearing, probably because it may be self-generated and hence it may not be recorded in the balance sheet separately. This is a self-generated brand. Therefore, Quick Bytes has not recognized the brand in its books of accounts. However, remember when you take over the assets and liabilities, if there are any items which are identifiable as per index 103, you will take them over at their respective fair values. So following is a separate balance sheet of high speed limited as on <coughs> 1st January 2012. So this is like the balance sheet of the Pico or the purchasing company. You have plant and equipment. You have investment in quick buy. This is at 10 lakhs. Now, how would this investment be constituted? We have acquired a 30% interest for 5 lakhs on 1st November and then acquired another 25% interest on 1st January 12 for 5 lakhs, which means you must have passed the entry in your SFS as investment account debit to bank 5 lakhs on 1st November, then another investment account debit to bank, another 5 lakhs on uh, uh, on 1st of January. So that is why this is 10 lakhs. So what happens in CFS? You take over all assets and all liabilities of the selling company that is Quick Bytes and instead you will remove the investment. You will create NCI, you will show goodwill. So what is the question asking you? In relation to the acquisition of Quick Bytes, you are required to first pass the necessary journal entries to give effect to the business combination in accordance with India's 103. So we'll have to pass the journal entries. Business combination is recorded in the consolidated financial statements. At the acquisition date that is 1st of January 2012, NCI is measured by the entity at fair value. So over here, if the market price is given, we take that. If it is not given, then we assume that the price at which the 25% stake is acquired on 1st of January is at fair value. So if 25% gives you 5 lakhs of value, then NCI will be how much? So you will do the proportionate working. This is to be done only if enough data is not available like in this case. Provide the working notes. Ignore deferred tax implication if any. In any case, if tax rate is not given, we would have ignored the deferred tax and prepare a consolidated balance sheet of high speed as per as on 1st January 2012. 
Now the idea of this video is to kind of run you through the overall concepts which are there in this uh, in this RTB. We are not going to go by a detailed line by line presentation. We are going to discuss each problems and pass the entries and do the working as per the relevant uh, as per the relevant adjustments for a better understanding. So when we look at question number one, we first need to pass the entry on first of January two thousand and. 12. So, first we will remeasure the existing investment. So, there will be separate working notes which you can refer in the RTP as well. However, investment will have to be remeasured. Now, how will you remeasure the investment? Well, your current carrying value of the investment is 5 lakh rupees. You have acquired on 1st of January investment at 5 lakhs. Ideally, equity method should have been applicable and over the next two months you would have recorded the investment using the equity method. However, the data is not available. Hence, you cannot do anything about that. However, if I have to find a fair value of this existing 30% stake, on 1st of January 2012, the fair value would be, well, 5 lakhs was the fair value today for a 25% stake. Then for a 30% stake, what would be the fair value? Well, if I do a cross multiplication, this should ideally be around 6 lakhs if I'm not wrong, 25, 30. So that's right. This will be around 6 lakhs. And as a result, in your ledger, if nothing is available, the investment appears at 5 lakhs, it has to go up to 6 lakhs and hence there is an increase of 1 lakh. So over here, this is investment account debit 1 lakh to a gain on remeasurement. And this will go to the profit and loss account. Over here, if nothing is given, the gain on remeasurement goes to the profit and loss account at the consolidated level. And as a result, your investment will now appear. Your existing investment, which was there at 5 lakhs, will increase by another 1 lakh and hence this will be plus another 1 lakh and hence this will come to let us say 11 lakhs. At the same time over here the reserves in when you are preparing your consolidated reserves this will increase by 1 lakh whatever is the gain on remeasurement will be recorded. So once the investment is remeasured it comes from 5 plus 1 that is equal to 6 lakhs and then another investment of 5 lakhs has been done in the SFS. So over here on 1st of January 2012 what we will do is after the remeasurement is done, you will take over the assets and liabilities. So on 1st of January 2012, you will take over the assets and liabilities of the selling company, which seems to be plant and equipment over here. We will take them over at fair value. So let us say plant and equipment or plant and machinery will be taken over at fair value. This is 7 lakh 50. Then investment in bonds. So this is investment in bonds. This will also be taken over, let us say, at fair value, which is let us say 5 lakhs. And then there is trade receivables. So there is trade receivables taken over also at fair value, which is 50,000. Apart from that, there is a brand which is identifiable because it is separable. At the stage of business combination, that brand will also be taken over at the fair value. So over here, let us say, there would be a brand which you will debit, which will be taken over at fair value, which is 350,000. So this is all assets taken over. Then you will also take over the liabilities. You will leave a line or so for the goodwill workings. You will also take over the liabilities which comprise of the short term loans, sorry, which comprise of the trade payables. Trade payables having a fair value of, let's say in short, trade payables having a fair value of 1,50,000. So this will give you all assets and liabilities on your calculator. If I if I want to find the net assets taken over, that is 7,50,000 plus 5,50,000 plus 3,50,000 plus minus 1,50,000. That is around 15 lakhs of net identifiable assets taken over. Apart from that, I will have to create the non-controlling interest NCI. Now, how much is the NCI in percentage? 100% is the total stake out of which 30 and 25 is held by the parent and hence the remaining 45% is attributable to NCI. Now NCI is to be recorded at fair value. Fair value is not separately given to us. In which case, how will you measure the fair value? Well, fair value in such a case will be calculated by a cross multiplication exercise where you will say that 3 lakhs is the fair value today. And that is the fair value for a 25% stake. Then for a 45% stake in your non-controlling interest, the fair value will be how much? So that's 3 lakhs divided by 0 0.25 into 0.45 and that comes to around 5 lakh 40. So your non-controlling interest comes to around 5 lakh 40,000. And now you have considered the entire, uh, uh, your entire net assets. You have considered the non-controlling interest and then the investment. So your investment will be eliminated. So one can say that your existing investment for a 30% stake, let us say, would be 6 lakhs after remeasurement. This will be eliminated. Apart from that, we can directly record in the separate statements or we can remove from the 
separate financial statements let us say an investment worth 5 lakhs so we are saying that today we are spending 5 lakhs if i am preparing a separate set of books i will say to bank 5 lakhs otherwise in any case in my separate financial statements i had shown 10 lakhs and on that separately i also have to consider the remeasurement so i will remove i will remove uh, the total 10 and 1 11 lakhs worth of investment and hence if i try to find a balancing figure at this stage that balancing figure should ideally give me goodwill so over here this will be what minus 5 lakh 40 minus 40 so over here if we were to find just a second let me just verify this okay so this is 12 lakh 15 13 13 and so this is what 11 50 15 lakhs 15 lakhs and we will have so this is 750 5 lakhs 50 thousand 3 lakh 50 thousand on the debits it is 16 lakh 50 and then on the credits it is 1 lakh 50 5 lakh 40 and 11 lakhs So we have 1 lakh 40. Now it seems that this appears to be like a capital reserve or a gain on bargain purchase. Uh, let me just see if I've made some mistake here. So let me just verify. NCI is coming to be 9 lakhs. So I guess uh, we have taken 5 lakhs to be the fair value for 25 percent oh so this is not 3 lakhs this is 5 lakhs sorry my bad calculation mistakes so this is 5 lakhs divided by 0.25 into 0 0.45 and you have 9 lakhs so over here this is 9 lakhs so these calculation mistakes can actually cost you dearly so be careful while you are solving and hence your balancing figure now if you were to do this is what 1650 on the debits and then this is 15 1 lakh 50 9 lakhs 6 lakhs and 5 lakhs so minus 750 minus 5 lakhs minus 50000 minus 3 lakh 50 thousand comes to a goodwill of 5 lakhs so if you see goodwill which is the balancing figure over here comes to 5 lakhs so this is your goodwill now if you want to record this and prepare a balance sheet based on these items what you will do is in your assets and liabilities you will add each and every item on your assets and liabilities so plant and equipment of 13 uh, 50 you will add 7 lakh 50 on plant and equipment investment in quick, quick bite you will eliminate the entire 11 lakh of investment so nothing will appear in your ultimate balance sheet from trade receivables you will separately add 50,000 investment in bonds is not there so you will show that separately so this is investment in bonds investment in bonds will appear at i guess 5 lakhs there will be a brand which will appear in the balance sheet at 3 lakh 50 and there will also be goodwill appearing in the balance sheet at 5 lakhs so if we were to take the total of every item in the balance sheet there is no separate cash taken over in this case so this is what 1350 plus 7 lakh 50 comes to i guess 21 lakhs investment in quick bites will become zero in fact assets and liabilities are taken over so this will be let's say 1 lakh 30 cash balances will be 5 lakh 20 and investment in bonds another 5 lakhs obviously within intangibles you will show the brand at 3 lakh 50 and goodwill will also appear as 5 lakhs on the equity and liability side share capital there will be no change it will continue to remain as 5 lakhs that is the acquirer share capital in the reserves on the date of acquisition there is you don't take over the assets and uh, you don't take over the reserves of the selling company however there is a 
1 lakh remeasurement gain and hence this will appear at 16 lakhs apart from that there will be NCI which is appearing at 9 lakhs which we will separately show within short term loans are you taking anything over no so this is at 4 lakhs only your short term loans trade payables are you taking anything over yes along with that this is another 1 lakh 50 and hence your total trade payables will be 4 lakh 50 and lastly you will have other liabilities nothing else and hence this is 2 lakh 50 at this stage remember all your gods and try to total up the balance sheet so this is 21 lakhs and 1 lakh 30 5 lakh 20 5 lakhs 3 lakh 50 and 5 lakhs so this comes to i guess 41 lakhs and on the equity and liability side this is what 21 lakhs total and what 13 4 lakh 50 and 2 lakh 50 and there you go 41 lakhs this is your magic number obviously you will have to prepare a schedule 3 format for the balance sheet in order to give effect to these adjustments so this takes care of question number one next you go to question number two this is on inventory which is on retail sales price method remember under cost flow assumptions inventory can be measured using specific identification method if inventory units are not interchangeable however if they are interchangeable you can typically follow fee for weighted average however in special cases you can sometimes follow for a manufacturer with the established history you can follow the standard cost method or for a retailer you can even follow the retail sales price method who has multiple items of inventory so under the retail sales price method what do we do we look at the se total selling price of the inventory you as a retailer i would know the mrp of the inventory and from that i will subtract the gross margin in order to find the inventory at cost or you can find the cogs ratio and apply that in order to find the cost of the inventory so this is on your retail sales price method so let us read this once an entity has the following details regarding the cost and the retail price of the goods purchased and unsold at the beginning of the year. So opening inventory and purchases. So this is at cost and their price. So if I total both of these that 6250 and 19500 comes to 25,000. 750 that is the cost of the total items and the total retail price or the selling price is 42,000 which means the difference between the two actually will be the gross profit so the difference between the two if I go to see will be 16,250 will be the profit margin your purchasing your purchase cost in total is 25,750 and your selling price in total is 42,000 so the difference between the two 16,250 will be like the gross margin now inventory on hand will be at 23,000 and sales for the period is at 19,000 so under inventory on hand is in the retail price column which means it is in the mrp or the sale price column and sales for the period are given as 19000 fair enough applying the retail method compute the following the percentage of the cost price over the retail price so over here cost price which is 25750 as a percentage of the retail price that is 42000 items in total at cost will be at 25750 so that is 25750 upon 42,000 as a percentage will be around 61.31 percentage approximately in percentage terms the cost of closing inventory you know the MRP of the closing inventory the cost will be 23,000 into 61.31 percent which means 23 into 61.31 percent so this is approximately 14,000 101 approximately this will be at cost and value of the cost of sales see sales are 19,000 again cost of sales will be at COGS so this is 19,000 approximately and okay if I want to calculate the cost of sales one can even say approximately you can take 19,000 as the total selling price into the margin of 61.31 percent and alternative working is also possible where you kind of prepare like the trading account where you say that your opening inventory at cost is 6250 this is your opening inventory your purchases let us say will be at i think 19500 we know that the sales over here during the time period is 19000 we know that the closing stock which we have just calculated using the retail sales price method is 14,101. Now, my gross profit can be calculated as per the GP margin and balancing figure. So, over here, if you have everything calculated, 
then I can find my GP as a balancing figure. So this will be, let us say, 19,000. So 6250 and 19,500. So this is 19,000 and 14,000. 101 minus 6250 minus 19,500. And this will be around 7351. This is your gross profit. 7351, which over here can also be calculated as if 100% is your sales, then your cost, let us say, is 61.31%, which means your gross profit is a difference. So, that is 100 minus 61.31, that will come to 38.69 approximately. And hence, if I do 19,000 into 38.61%, I will get 73 approximately 7350 plus or minus certain degree of rounding off, there will be certain rounding off. So, that will be the profit earned during the year on the sale of inventory. So, this you can calculate directly using 19,000 into for example 38.69 percent and the cost you can calculate using this working, both of them will give you the exact same answer. So, if I do 19,000 into 61.31 there will be some approximation because it is not 61.31 it is 61.30 something something so there will be certain degree of approximation but keeping that aside so if you calculate this will be 11,649 which can also be calculated as opening stock plus purchases minus closing stock so if you take on your calculator 6250 plus 19,500 minus 14,101 we get approximately 11,649 which is exactly the same number or when you calculate GP, GP can be found as a balancing figure over here like 19,000 plus 14,101 minus 6250 minus 19,500. So, that is around 7351. You can also calculate that GP as 19,000 into 38.69%, 7351. So, either ways you do, you are going to get the same answer. You can either prepare the trading and profit and loss account and find the answer or you can just do the workings directly and find the answer over here. So, this is on retail sales price method. Relatively lesser questions are there in the institute study material though we have done a question also on the retail sales price method. So, this is on the application of retail sales price method. Next is question number 19. This is uh, question number 3 on index 19. This is regarding employee benefits. Now, over here, largely the entire set of data has been given and you are just asked to show the expense and the amount to be shown in the balance sheet. But all the data points are given, just a few additional things. Usually, when you calculate the defined benefit liability, you take the opening liability, to that you add the current service cost, you add the interest, you add past service cost, if any, you add actuarial gains or actuarial losses and gains, if any, you subtract. Now, these actuarial gains, in practice, when you disclose, you have to give certain bifurcations on the actuarial gains arising due to demographic assumptions, due to financial assumptions, experience adjustments, etc. So, these are additional disclosure, remember, but these are just a part of actuarial gains and losses. So, over here, you will see a few terms which may be slightly different. However, these terms together are nothing but a breakup of actuarial gains or losses. Like when you look at index 41, there is a fair value gain. You sometimes show the difference between as fair value gain as the fair value change due to price or fair value change due to, let us say, uh, uh, age. In a similar way, actual gains or actual losses need to be bifurcated for the purpose of the disclosure. So, we will read this once. From the following particulars, compute the net defined benefit liability and expense to be recognized in PNL. They are not telling you to show how much will go in the remeasurement reserve as a part of other comprehensive income. They are asking you to show the net liability and the expense to be recognized in the PNL. So, for the liability, for the defined benefit obligation, and then the plan assets were given closing as on 31st December 12 and then opening. Balance at the beginning of the year, let us say that is opening. Current service cost for liability you will add. Interest cost you will add. Change in demographic assumptions this is assumptions made by the actuary in terms of age or demography 
change in financial assumption like the discount rate increment etc and experience variance all of these together these three together will be treated as changes due to actuarial assumptions so one two and three the highlighted part are changes due to actuarial assumptions all the three and hence they will impact the defined benefit liability in the second effect of this will go in the other comprehensive income as a part of let us say remeasurement reserve or adjustment so over here if this is positive this is to be added this is also to be added if it was negative we would have subtracted so over here plus or minus as the case may be benefits paid in the in the year 2012 nothing is paid but in 2011 something is paid so let us say benefits paid will be subtracted investment income will not impact the liability employer contribution return on plan assets and hence if i were to find the liability it's just a total 63.25 plus 5.84 plus 4.27 plus 0.62 plus 3.58 plus or rather minus 2.49 and hence this will be 75.01 at the end at the start this will be 47.08 plus 4.97 plus 3.56 plus 1.86 plus 1.93 plus 4.46 minus 0.61 and hence this will be around 63.25 so your opening liability and the closing liability have been computed then you look at plan assets at the beginning of the year plan assets were 14.65 you add 14.65 so if you go to see this number should ideally tally this is 63.25 at the end will become 63.25 at the beginning of the next year so when we do the working let us say this will be 14.65 uh, plus or rather minus 0.61 so this will reduce uh, benefits paid will be paid out of the plan assets so it will reduce investment income you will separately add employers contribution so this will be added and return on plan assets plus or minus depending on whether it is positive or negative so over here plus 1.12 plus 7 minus 0.35 should come to around 21.81 if i go to see opening over here is 21.8 there may be certain 0 0.01 approximation that is fine so in the next this is 21.8 and plus 1.47 plus 8 plus 2.12 and hence this is 33.39 now what do we have to show we have to show the balance of the net defined benefit liability on 31st december 2000 on 31st December 2012 and then 31st December 2011 so over here your liability minus asset that is your net defined benefit liability so your liability comes to for example 75.01 assets are 33.39 75.01 33.39 0.39 the difference between the two is the net liability and then 63.25 and 21.8 63.25 and 21 point let's say 81 or 80 as the case may be so if you look at the difference over here this will be 75.01 and the difference is 41.62 and then 63.25 minus 21.81 this is 41.44 so this is your net defined benefit liability to be shown in the balance sheet <coughs> now if the question is also asking the expense to be recorded let us say we highlight the expense with a blue highlighter expense over here current service cost interest cost this will definitely be an expense in the PL. changes in demographic assumptions changes in financial assumptions will all be a part of other comprehensive income benefits paid will not affect the PL investment income is usually assumed to be like your expected return on plan assets so that will usually impact your pnl employees contribution will not and return on plan assets over here so there is some investment income and then there is a return on plan assets so ideally if nothing is available we'll assume these are like changes in return you expected a particular return and then there are certain changes in return so in my profit and loss account I will have the current service cost, the interest cost and from this you will subtract the estimated investment income. 
you can also take the return on plan assets we don't know whether there is a change in return on plan assets or not so over here this will be 5.84 4.27 so this is 5.84 4.27 4.97 and 3.56 now you have to see whether the return on plan assets uh, is over here you can assume that these are changes in return or you can assume this is actual return in which case you can take the total of these two so over here what has the institute done over here if you go to the solution the institute over here has in your profit and loss account subtracted just the investment income it has just subtracted the investment income it has assumed that the remaining return is like the changes in return on plan assets and hence it will go to the other comprehensive income alternatively you can always assume that the investment income is like interest and the return on plan assets like the realized return and hence over here there is a small possibility that your impact in the panel solution might be slightly different so over here this is 1.47 you have to net them off and 1.12 again net demo from and show the net income and hence this is what 5.84 4.27 minus 1.47 comes to around 8.64 and 4.97 plus 3.56 minus 1.12 can be 7.41 in my opinion there is an alternative solution possible over here on the return on plan assets assumption if you assume this to be changes in return it will go to the oci if you are assuming this to be mere return which is same as what is expected like capital appreciation then it can be taken in the pnl as well so this takes care of question number three next you go to question number four which is on share based payment so let us refer question number four on share based payment entity a runs a copper mining business entity a has a year end of 31st march and dividends are declared on the shares accrued to the employees during the three year period so fair enough so we are saying that when employees will get their shares even the dividends that is accruing to them will be accruing for these employees if the condition is met the employees will receive the shares together with the dividends that have been declared on those shares during the three years up to 31st march 2013 so over here the vesting period seems to be a three-year vesting period the entity estimates on 1st of april 2010 that its shares are valued at 10 rupees and the granted fair value of each share is 10 rupees so it seems that the exercise price is zero so whatever is the value of the share is to be taken as the value for this working entity a prepares financial statements up to 31st march and on 1st april 10 that is on the grant date so this is like the grant date it estimates 800 shares will vest at the end of the first year that is 31st march 11 it revises the estimates to 780 and on 31st March 12, it further revises the estimates to 750. Remember, the expenses recorded by the expected number of employees were expected to continue till the end of the vesting period, which we earlier thought to be 800. Then moving on to 780, then moving on to 750, and then 750 shares ultimately based on 31st March 13, based on the number of employees still in employment as on that date. On 1st April 10, as a part of long term incentive, NTDA provisionally awards its sales employees. So maybe this plan is towards its selling employees. 1000 entity A shares receivable on 31st March 13 provisionally provided they continue in employment for three years. If they don't, they will not be entitled. So we believe that 800 employees out of those 800 shares are given to those employees out of those 1000 will be vested with changes to 780 and then changes to 750 as well. Explain the accounting treatment for the above share based awards based on the satisfaction of the condition that the employees must remain in employment until 31st March 13. The requirement to remain in employment is a service condition and would not be reflected in the fair value of the share awards. So over here, what will we do? We take the number of shares based on year 1, year 2 and year 3. Remember, year 1 working is based on the position at the end of the year, which is the most reliable estimate and hence you will start. Let us at 780, you are expecting 780 shares to be vested and the fair value of each share is 10 rupees and hence this is what? 7800 spread it pro rate over the vesting period of three years and hence this is 7800 divided by three comes to around 2600 less earlier recorded nothing is earlier recorded and hence 2600 will be the expense in the first year in the second year the number of employees who are expected to continue changes to 750 into 10 and hence this is 7500 
till date two third of this should be recorded which means 5000 out of which earlier 2600 has been recorded and hence the expense to be recorded now will be an additional 2400 and then in the third year this is 750 again 10 this is 7500 3 by 3 and hence this is 7500 out of which 2000 uh, sorry till date 5000 has been recorded and another 5000 minus uh, 2000 so this is 2500 of expense to be recorded so your expenses to be recorded in each of the year will be 2600 2400 and 2500 your journal entry in each year will be eb account debit which will go to the profit and loss to the share based payment or sbp reserve as the case may be the question is not asked you to pass journal entry but this would have been the entry so this is for question number four next is index 101 now this is fairly tricky if you read this case again institute has uh, asked you fairly tricky questions at least in the rtvs thankfully the main papers don't have as much of index 101 coverage this is a standard which makes students a little uncomfortable but nevertheless you know what has come in the rtv just in case it repeats you should be in a position to answer so over here what is happening now abc is a public company in the business of exploration and production of oil and gas and hydrocarbon related activities outside India like British Petroleum for example or let us say ONGC. It operates overseas projects directly and or through subsidiaries by participation in various joint arrangements and investments in associates. So, it can have subsidiaries, investments in associates, joint arrangements etc. The company was following accounting standards as notified by the company rules of 31st March 11. However, the company adopted INDES with effect from 1st April 11. So, there is a transition happening from AS to INDES. The goodwill recognized was in accordance with AS21 and AS27. AS21 was on subsidiary consolidation. AS21 was on joint arrangements. Was due to corporate structure and line by line consolidation of subsidiaries and proportionate consolidation of jointly controlled entities which was prepared on historical cost convention. So, this is as per AS21, this is line by line full consolidation and AS27 in your accounting standards required a proportionate consolidation. ABC has not taken into consideration the valuation of underlying oil and gas reserves for which excess amount that is goodwill calculated as per the relevant index has been paid by the company at the time of acquisition. Just to elaborate what this kind of means is let us say in the year 2009 the acquisition happened. At that point you paid a consideration because there are certain subsidiaries which have which have a lot of assets including there are certain reserves. So, companies which have more reserves you will pay more. However, while calculating net assets you did not consider these oil and gas reserves for whatever reason under AS this was not shown. So, your assets let us say were appearing at uh, let us say 1000 you paid a consideration let us say of 1500. Out of this 1500 let us say 300 is because there were great reserves in one of the companies however you did not show them separately and hence as per as the goodwill that appeared was 500 now if this goodwill was calculated as per index you would have calculated this goodwill by considering identifiable net assets like you did even in question one you recorded brand separately in a similar way these oil and gas reserves if they are separately identifiable their cost may not be reliably determinable but at the stage of business combination if the fair value is attributable you will record a fair value them separately and not really what you say subsume it within goodwill over here if there are oil and gas reserves which are having fair value of 300 in the market currently if I take my net assets to be 1000 and then add 300 because there are separate oil and gas reserves my net assets will be 1300 and hence my goodwill will be 200 rupees however in this case these oil and gas reserves are not shown separately and hence if I am paying for them the value is subsumed or included within goodwill. So, the goodwill of 500 includes probably 300 which is attributable to these oil and gas reserves which were not shown separately under AS but which should have been ideally shown separately under INDES. The company further considered that in oil and gas companies the goodwill generated on acquisition of mineral rights either through jointly controlled entities or through subsidiaries inherently derives its value from the underlying mineral rights and accordingly the value of such goodwill depletes as the underlying mineral resources are extracted. So, over here under AS what they have been doing is they are probably amortizing goodwill in the ratio amortizing goodwill in the ratio in which these mineral rights are depleted amortizing goodwill in a ratio 
of mineral rights depletion now ind as is against such or any kind of amortization of goodwill it says under ind as goodwill has to be amortized uh, goodwill need not be amortized but it needs to be tested for impairment annually therefore taking a prudent approach and considering the above substance the company amortizes the goodwill in respect of its subsidiaries and jointly controlled assets over the life of the underlying mineral rights using units of production method this allowed the company to utilize the value of goodwill over the life of mineral rights and completely charge the goodwill over the life of the reserve so maybe out of the 300 or 500 let us say of goodwill you have amortized some of the goodwill as per as for the financial year 10 11 the company availed transition exemption under index 101 and has not applied the principles of index 103 now what does index 101 say index 101 says that at the time of transition you can take the previous gap carrying value for business combination you can take the previous gap carrying values that is you can decide not to restate past business combinations or you can restate past business combinations with effect from a particular date in this question we, we have been very categorically told that the company has decided not to restate the previous gap carrying values or not restate the not restate any of the past business combinations which means whatever was the previous gap carrying value for goodwill for other mineral resources etc should ideally continue Achha. however there are two special cases or there are two conditions even when you take this transition exemption have to be applicable that is when you take the previous gap when you take the previous gap goodwill you have to check for two things first you have to check for impairment if any in the goodwill as recorded as per previous gap so over here if a recoverable value is given you will compare the recoverable value with the goodwill value to see if that goodwill is impaired even if you are taking the previous gap carrying value you have to check for impairment and second if there were any separately identifiable assets if there were any separately identifiable assets which should have been recorded but were not earlier recorded then these assets have to be recorded at the date of transition and hence the goodwill value will be proportionately adjusted so over here let us say these are the two adjustments to be done now if this was 2009 and let us say approximately 10 percent amortization was done in goodwill in which case let's say 50 rupees was amortized and hence goodwill was shown at 450 and in a similar way mineral rights were amortized also by 10 percent and hence it is a 10 percent amortization and hence this is 270 okay so i'll not go back and retrospectively restate however in my in my date of transition balance sheet the goodwill appears at 450 now ideally index says amortization should not happen however as permits amortization whatever be the method as permits i want to take the previous gap carrying value and hence ideally 450 will be the carrying value of the goodwill that will be taken as per index now going forward goodwill will not be amortized not in the ratio of mineral rights not in any other ratio goodwill as per index cannot be amortized but what has happened in the past in the, has happened in the past we have taken a choice not to retrospectively restate the goodwill and as a result ideally the goodwill will continue to remain at 450 are we given a separate recoverable value does not appear to be and hence we can continue at 450 however do we have a separate identifiable asset on the date of transition which should have been shown well yes and as a result as on the date of transition as on the date of transition what will happen is you will have to show the goodwill but you will also have to show the other mineral ya fir oil and gas reserves so over here let's say ong that is oil and gas reserves you will show them at the carrying value ideally the total value of 450 uh, the total value of 500 includes 300 and now the total value of 450 includes let us say 270 so we will say okay 270 has to be shown separately and hence in my balance sheet when i take over the goodwill this goodwill will be let us say at 450 minus 270 because this 270 has to be shown separately and hence this will appear at 180 going forward there will be no further amortization we have taken notional numbers question is not given you numbers if it had given it would have been a little more easier abc is considering the substance over form 
of goodwill to be in the nature of acquisition cost and intends to continue amortizing of goodwill recognized under AS in respect of its subsidiaries and joint ventures over the life of the underlying mineral using units of production method even under index post transition this is not permitted once the transition happens index applies in letter and spirit and under index goodwill has to be tested for impairment annually it cannot be amortized and hence this is clearly not permitted comment on the appropriateness of the accounting treatment under index for the amortization of goodwill we will say this is under index it is not am appropriate to amortize goodwill at all and state whether the accounting treatment in respect of amortization of goodwill is correct or not no it is not correct so basically on transition this will happen on the transition first part on the date of transition you will take over goodwill and you will also show a separate oil and gas reserve at the previous gap carrying value so on the date of transition whatever be the previous gap carrying value after even amortizing you will show that and then goodwill will be shown separately we have just taken notional values just for your reference if you even ignore any kind of amortization then the previous gap carrying value of goodwill should be taken over and oil and gas reserve should be taken over but oil and gas reserves were not shown separately well at, because they were subsumed within goodwill now they have to be separated out from goodwill and shown separately and the remainder will be shown as goodwill you will not retrospectively restate the goodwill the goodwill of 450 today after amortization will continue to appear ideally at 450 provided you test for impairment there is no impairment and provided there are no other identifiable assets which should have been recorded which were not recorded now there is a 270 identifiable asset which should have been recorded which is not been recorded and hence the 270 worth of asset you will show separately and hence the remaining 180 will be shown as goodwill this goodwill going forward will not be amortized and which will be tested for impairment annually as per index 36 so this is a fairly cumbersome question i would say on a very specific guidance so you can refer that next is question number six on index 23 you will mark this question as important fairly interesting adjustments are done over here a few points that you have to remember before you start this question or do this question is when there are general borrowings remember you can start capitalizing borrowing cost provided there is an actual borrowing cost if there is no actual borrowing cost there can be no capitalization what will you capitalize there is no borrowing cost only secondly once your borrowings are taken and specifically if there are general borrowings you will never do a one-to-one -one correlation the standard does not require you to do a one-to-one -one correlation like even in inventory under index 2 if you follow methods like v4 weighted average you assume that the inventory that is purchased first has been sold first now in practice you might be as a shopkeeper seeing that the customer is picking up some other inventory but you are not required to do a one-to-one -one correlation for inventory the standard allows you to assume that the inventory which was purchased first was sold first even if the customer has picked up some other item of inventory and that got sold in a similar way under <coughs> borrowing cost you will take under borrowing cost you will take the uh, uh, the general borrowings in a particular year you will calculate the weighted average borrowing rate and compare that with the general uh, compare that with the expenditure incurred you will not see whether the expenditure is incurred before or after you will not do that one-to-one -one correlation that no this money must be from uh, from uh, equity funds no we don't have to do that secondly how do you calculate expenditure incurred behind qualifying asset expenditure incurred on qualifying asset includes cash expenses plus assets transferred for the purpose of constructing qualifying asset plus interest cost already capitalized minus progress payment received or minus grants so this is how you calculate expenditure that is to say in multi-year questions and very rarely does the institute asks you multi-year questions most of the questions in your ICI study material are single period questions but in multi-period questions what will happen is your expenditure incurred for subsequent periods will obviously including the cash paid but it will also include the interest that has already been capitalized and hence in the subsequent years the borrowing cost should be capitalized based on the cash paid plus interest already capitalized so a few principles of index 23 that you need to follow it's a fairly tricky and an interesting question so let us try to go through this question number six lt limited is in the process of constructing a building okay the construction process is expected to make 18 months from 1st of January 2011 to 30th June 2012. 
so that is an 18 month time frame so that is a substantial period of time and hence the building appears to be a qualifying asset the building meets the definition of a qualifying asset lt limited incurs the following expenditure for construction so on 1st january 30th june 31st march and 30th june as a case maybe these are the expenses that are incurred okay on 1st july 2011 acha when is the first point of expenditure incurred 1st january 11 second 30th june 11 then 31st march 12 and 30th june 12 here on 1st july 11 LT Limited issued 10% redeemable debentures of 50 crores. Are you told uh, which date they are issued? Yes, 1st of July. The proceeds from the debentures form part of the company's general borrowing. So, the question is very categorically tell you that debentures are a part of the general borrowing pool, which it uses to finance the construction of qualifying asset. It can use for construction of qualifying asset or some other purpose as well. That is building. LT had no borrowings, general or specific, before 1st July 11, which means when the expenditure was incurred of 5 crores, let us say on 1st January, or expenditure was incurred on 30th June of 20 crores, there was actually no borrowing. So, you cannot capitalize any borrowing cost because there was no borrowing in the first place and did not incur any borrowing cost before that date. Okay. LT incurred 25 crores of construction costs before obtaining the general borrowings on 1st July 11. That is pre-borrowing expenditure and 25 crores after obtaining the general borrowing that is post-borrowing expenditure. So, over here, if we just verify this, when was the borrowing taken? 1st of July 2011. So, before this, you had incurred 25 crores, 5 and 20. And after this also, you have incurred 25 crores. I mean, even if this was not given, your solution would have remained the same. For each of the financial year, that is 31st March 2011, 2012 and 2013, calculate the borrowing cost that LT Limited is permitted to capitalize as a part of the building cost. Now, remember capitalization can start from once loan is taken. If loan is itself not taken, how can there be any capitalization? So, when I look at the year, when I look at the year 2000, 2001, let us say, or 2010-11 let us say if I look at the year 10-11 in which case there is an expenditure of 5 crore which is incurred there is an expenditure of 20 crore sir but uh, I mean to be honest in this year there is an expenditure of only 5 crore which is incurred on 1st of January however if I were to capitalize borrowing cost this is 5 crores into a 0% rate of interest because there is no borrow there is no weighted average borrowing rate there has to be a borrowing rate on which one would have said, okay, you do 5 crores into 0% into 3 by 12. Your answer has to be 0 because there is no borrowing. If there is no borrowing, what will you capitalize? The weighted average borrowing rate over here will be 0%. During the year, yes, you have spent 5 crores on 1st of January till 31st March. 3 months have gone by. However, there is no borrowing during the year and hence there will be no borrowing cost capitalization. Now, when you come to the year 2011-12, there is a single borrowing only there is a single borrowing and that is at the rate of so you don't need to separately calculate the weighted average borrowing rate because it is going to come to 10 percent only because it is single borrowing you can do 10 percent into 50 crores into 9 by 12 upon 50 into 9 by 12 you are going to get the same answer this is going to be let us say 10 percent on a per annum basis only so now when is the expenditure incurred we will say that uh, sir the expenditure is incurred on 31st march 2012 which means it is incurred on the very last day and hence during the year as well will there be any borrowing cost capitalization well for the expenditure incurred on 31st march it is incurred on the very last day however what about the expenses already incurred of 5 crores of 20 crores what about those expenses which have already been incurred sir they have been incurred uh, maybe from your own funds because there was no borrowing well ind as 23 does not require you to do that attribution ind as 23 says that well you have spent 5 crores and 20 crores already behind a qualifying asset probably had there been no qualifying asset you might not need a borrowing of 50 crores in the first place you might have taken a 25 crores borrowing because a 25 crores which you spent on the qualifying asset would have been available and hence if i have taken a 50 crore borrowing and you have till that date incurred a 5 and 20 that is 25 crores behind 
a qualifying asset some part of the borrowing cost is attributable to the expenditure incurred you do not have to do that one to one matching that money is coming out of uh, uh, equity funds no we are doing allocation and for allocation we are saying that if the borrowing is taken on 1st of july and as on that date or even after that date if there is any money spent behind the qualifying asset we will consider that from that date borrowing cost is attributable to the qualifying asset what is the general assumption or logic behind that the general assumption or logic is had there been no qualifying asset then 5 and 20 must may not must, would not have been spent in the past so it would be available in the company's bank account so for all you know you might need not need a borrowing of 50 crores you might need a much smaller borrowing and hence a part of the borrowing is because you constructed or spent money behind a qualifying asset whatever be the logic you have to attribute borrowing cost so with effect from 1st July 2011 when the loan is taken with effect from that date till date 5 and 20 that is 25 of expenditure has been incurred and nothing out of this is from a specific borrowing into let us say 10% which is the rate of return per annum into 9 months. So which are those 9 months well this is 1st July 2011 to 31st March 2012. So, you can obviously calculate by taking the weighted average annual expenditure, but from a simplistic working perspective, you can even take the working directly. So, this is 25 into 10 percent into let us say 9 by 12 and hence this comes to around 1.875, 1.875. There is another expenditure which is incurred on 31st of March 2012. This is an expenditure of 20 crores. However, this is incurred on the very last day. So, you can say 20, plus 20 crores into let us say 10 percent per annum into for workings you can take 0 by 12 it is on the very last day and hence this is 0 and hence your borrowing cost to be capitalized will be 1.875 you will compare this with the actual borrowing cost so this is within your actual borrowing cost if you go to see of 50 crores into 10 percent into let us say 9 by 12 so if your actual borrowing cost is let us say 3 point 75 if i am not wrong out of this 3.75 you will say 1.875 will be capitalized so over here your entry will be for example among other things capital work in progress or building under construction account debit during the year you must have spent just for your reference during the year you must have spent on so if you look at the balance you will say capital work in progress account debit to bank till date how much have you spent well i have spent 5 crores on 1st january another 20 crores on 30th of june and another 20 crores on 31st march which means i have spent a total of 45 apart from that some borrowing cost has also been capitalized so capital work in progress account debit let us say to interest so you must have paid certain interest so effectively if you go to see your journal entry will be interest account debit during the year 37.5 uh, sorry 3.75 just for your knowledge question is not asking you to pass general entries to bank interest account debit to bank let us say 3.75 and then interest being a nominal account has to be closed a part of this interest will be closed against cwip and a part of this will go to the profit and loss so we will say just for academic completion in cwip 1.875 will go and in the profit and loss the remaining so if this is 3.75 so out of 3.75 1.875 is capitalized and hence the remaining i think 1.875 will go to the profit and loss account so over here therefore your balance in your cwip cwip is capital work in progress that is building under construction on 1st of april 2012 will be 45 for the money that has been spent actually plus another 1.875 and hence this will be around 46.875 so the balance in your capital work in progress account will be 46.875 now this balance in the capital work in progress account is the expenditure incurred this represents the expenditure incurred remember how is expenditure incurred calculated is calculated as cash payments that is 45 crores plus asset transferred which is not the case over here like in joint ventures in your ca foundation or 11 12 you said sometimes co-venture or transfer assets so plus that 
plus interest already capitalized. In the first year, there was no interest capitalized. However, in the second year, there's a 1.875 interest capitalized and hence your expenditure incurred on the qualifying asset is 46.875 till date. Now, why is this relevant? Because well, in the second, in the third year that you go, that is the year 2012-13, the asset becomes ready for use. So, the asset becomes ready to use. On 30th June, it becomes ready on 30th June 2012. So that means for the first three months, if there is any borrowing cost that is incurred, it will be attributable to the extent of expenditure incurred to the qualifying asset. And hence, on 1st of April 2012, there is 46.875. Remember the weighted average borrowing rate, there's a single borrowing only that is at the rate of 10%. So this is 46.875 into 10 percent into 3 by 12 now a lot of time students say sir during the year i have not spent any money are but you have already spent money in the past and as a result that will be incurring borrowing cost in the current year it is like saying that if you were to buy a house and you have made the down payments and you have paid certain installments and the builder is constructing the building till the time the building is ready the fact that you have taken a loan and paid those installments interest will continue whether you spend money in the current year or not because you have taken a loan and given money to the builder out of that loan, the interest will continue. So over here, 46.875 has been spent behind the qualifying asset. Now you should not go into that territory, sir. How are we calculating interest on interest? We have even discussed this earlier when we discussed uh, this standard that this is just an attribution method. This is just an allocation method where we are trying to say that till debt, how much is the expenditure that is spent overall behind the qualifying asset? You have paid to the laborers, you have paid for material that is a part of the expenditure towards the qualifying asset in a similar way. If you have paid to the lenders towards interest which is capitalized that is also payment towards the qualifying asset hence 46.875 is attributable to the qualifying asset this will not result in a wrong capitalization because if your actual interest is lower than that you will not capitalize so over here 46.875 into 10 percent into 3 by 12 so this will be into 10 percent into 3 by 12 so this will come to let us say one point one seven one or something so this will be 1.17 further expenditure is incurred on the last day 30 of june 2012 of five crores into again you will do 10 percent into let us say zero by 12 which is basically zero and hence the amount to be capitalized will be 1.17 so in summary if you have to figure out what is the interest which is to be capitalized well in the year 31st march 11 it is zero for 2012 it is 1.875 and for 2013 it is 1.17 so these are the three interest amounts we will just verify that once which is to be capitalized so this is three interest amounts where is this zero then this is 1.875 and this is around 1.17 approximately Okay, so this takes care of question number six, definitely a very interesting and an important question as well. Then you go to question number seven, which is on index 115. Now, most of these questions, a lot of these questions are simple questions or a repeat of the questions which have earlier been there in the study material or past RTBs or your past exam questions like this is similar to the question that we have in our material along with what had come in the May 2018 exams. So, if there is index 115 and you are following the input method, ideally revenue should be recognized based on the progress. If revenue is to be recognized over time, then it should be based on progress under input method. Progress can be calculated as cost incurred upon the total estimated cost. However, if there are certain major cost where the entity let us say on a loose footing, uh, we just explain entity has very limited obligation. Its obligation is to purchase an asset and just deliver it. Uh, to the buyer the asset is let us say of the buyer only our responsibility is not to construct or make the asset it is just to purchase the asset and there is no separate performance obligation for that in which case you modify the input method like there was an example of elevators where you were constructing let us say a building and in which you had a major purchase where you were just merely responsible for acquiring and putting the elevators inside in which case we said that your input method or your progress has to be modified your progress is based on your actual work done which is the cost incurred other than that elevator divided by the total estimated cost other than that elevator that is your responsibility that will 
truly show the progress that you have done on the project and not just by merely purchasing materials so revenue for these items which are merely purchased on behalf of the customer and then given to the customer will be recorded on an actual basis so if you have incurred let's say 10 lakhs behind the elevator then 10 lakhs will be shown as a part of your cost and 10 lakhs will be shown as a part of the revenue as well however your revenue recognition will be based on the progress which is done for the remaining project so you will take the remaining cost which is actually incurred upon the total remaining cost that will be progress into whatever is the remaining revenue that will give you the revenue to be recognized we have done this it's just a similar thing here instead of an elevator i think there is an air conditioner Company X enters into an agreement on 1st of January with a customer for renovation of the hospital and install new air conditioners for a total consideration of 50 lakhs. So this is your total revenue. The promised renovation including the installation of new air conditioner is a single performance obligation satisfied over time. Okay. So this is over time recognition to be done. Total expected costs are 40 lakhs including 10 lakhs towards the air conditioners. Okay. Company X determines that it acts as a principal in accordance with India 115 because it obtains control of the air conditioners before they are transferred to the customer. The customer obtains control of the air conditioners when they are delivered to the hospital of premises. So, the moment I acquire and deliver it to the hospital premises, it becomes a customer's assets. Company X uses an input method based on the cost incurred to measure its progress towards complete satisfaction of the performance obligation. So, it uses an input method. So, revenue is to be recognized over time using an input method. But input method over here will be the cost incurred upon total estimated cost. So, total estimated cost is 40 lakhs. And you will compare that with the cost incurred. We will say that 40 lakhs includes 10 lakhs of air conditioners. And hence, we will separate that out and you will modify the input method. As on 31st March 11, other cost including uh, other costs incurred excluding the air conditioners. Excluding the air conditioners are 6 lakhs. Okay. So, maybe your total cost is 10 lakhs for the air conditioner and 6 lakhs. Other cost, so 16 lakhs is your total cost. So, should you do 16 lakhs divided by 40? No. 16 lakhs includes 10 lakhs. So, you will remove that and take the remaining 6 lakhs and 40 also includes 10 lakhs. You will remaining, remove the 10 and take the remaining 30. Whether company X should include the cost of air conditioners in measurement of its progress of performance obligation? Answer is no. You will explain the reasons why it is written. How should the revenue be recognized for the year ended 31st March 2011? So, if I had to measure progress, I will say that the progress over here will be measured by the remaining cost that is 6 upon the remaining total cost that is 40 minus 10 that is equal to 30 and hence your progress I guess is 20%. So, if I had to recognize revenue, my revenue will be based on the revenue for the air conditioners which is the entire 10 lakhs and for the other parts for the other parts it is 50 minus 10 which has already been recorded so for the remaining 40 20 percent is completed so 40 into 20 percent i guess comes to 8 so over here this is 40 my uh, into uh, 20 percent this is 8 so my total revenue is 18 just for reference if i had to figure out and compare this with the total cost my total cost will also include the cost of the air conditioner which is 10 and then the other cost of let us say 6 and hence my total cost will be 16. So, 16 will be my total cost and 18 will be my total revenue. So, 2 will be my total profit which arises on work that you have done on AC. There is no profit, there is no loss as well. You can't say that the expense is 10 and then there is no corresponding revenue. You will recognize revenue to the extent of cost. So, there will be no profit, there will be no loss. Profit recognition will be based on the other work that you are going to do. So, this is question number 7. Then this question number 16, a very basic index 16 question. Company X built a new plant that was brought into use on 1st April 11. The cost to construct the plant was 1.5 crores and the estimated useful life of the plant is 20 years. So, depression will be over 20 years and company accounts for the plants using cost model. Take care. The initial carrying amount of the plant included an amount of 10 lakhs for decommissioning so, this 1.5 crores already includes the 10 lakhs. So, you don't have to separately add, which was determined using a discounted of 10%. Achha, should this be included? The answer is yes. At initial recognition, the present value of site restoration should be included as a part of the cost of the asset with a corresponding credit to a provision. On 31st March 2012, company X remeasures the provision for decommissioning to 13 lakhs. 
Now, under cost model, if the provision for site restoration is remeasured, the second effect is going into the cost of the asset. It makes the asset more costly if the provision increases or less costly if the provision reduces. So, over here, if I look at the property, plant and equipment on 1st April 2011, let us say I take the number in lakhs at initial recognition. This will be, let us say, 150 lakhs minus I will recognize a depreciation. Depreciation will be 150 divided by 20 into one year that has gone by. So, this is 150 by 20 comes to let us say 7.5 and hence the asset will be shown at 142.5 on 31st March 2012. Apart from that, there will be a provision for site restoration. Provision for site restoration whose opening balance will be 10 lakhs. On this, there will be first some unwinding. Unwinding will be the opening balance will now be one more year closer. So, 10 into 10 percent and hence this is 11 and hence your carrying value actually is 11 rupees. However, this becomes 13 rupees and hence the carrying value increases. So, this will be adjusted against a property, plant and equipment. So, this 2 rupees that is basically 13 minus 11 will make the asset more costlier. We thought that ideally we should have paid 11 in present value terms at the end of the first year. However, that increases to 13 and hence this will be PP account debit to provision. So, you have credited the provision and hence the revised provision will come to 13 and the second effect will be increase in the PP. So, over here increase in PV of site restoration obligation by 2 rupees and hence your asset will be 144.5. What is the question asking you? Provide the necessary journal entries at the end of the year 31st March 12 for recording depreciation and decommissioning provision. So, your entries will be over here considering uh, your decommissioning provision your entry will be asset account debit 2 rupees to provision for site restoration 2 rupees separately a depreciation of 7.5 will be recorded depreciation account debit to asset or if you are providing a, a separate accumulated depreciation then provision for depreciation and then there will be a separate 1 rupee entry for unwinding that is finance cost account debit or unwinding of discount to provision for site restoration. So, that is about question number Eight. Next, you go to question number 9. This is on index 20 government grants. Government grants of two types linked to assets or linked to income. If they are not linked to acquisition of a particular asset, they are treated as linked to income. If they are linked to income, then if they are attributed to a past loss or unconditional in nature, you take it to the PNL immediately. Or if they are linked to future expenses or benefits that have to be incurred, then you will defer it in the ratio of the expenses and in absence of that on a time basis. So, A limited received a government grant of rupees 10 lakh to defray that is to meet expenses for environmental protection. So, this is not for the purpose of acquisition of a qualifying asset and hence this is a grant linked to income. Achha, these are expenses which are yet to be incurred and hence this is a grant linked to income which is towards future cost or future expenses that are going to be incurred. Expected environmental cost to be incurred is rupees 3 lakhs per annum for the next five years. So, the cost incurred is equally over the next five years. How should A present such grant relating to income in its financial statements? So, first of all, when you receive this grant, the general entry will be bank account debit to deferred income or deferred grant 10 lakh rupees and then this grant will be deferred over the next five years in the ratio of expenses which seems to be equal and hence your grant amortization. So, your grant will be amortized to the extent of 10 lakhs divided by uh, 5 or 10 lakhs into in each year 3 by 15 your total expense 3 lakhs over your total expenses. So, 10 lakhs divided by 5 which comes to approximately 2 lakh per annum. Now, how will you present the 2 lakh per annum? There are two alternatives. Alternative 1 you can show your ex environmental protection cost of 3 lakhs and then an other income of 2 lakhs and an alternative 2 which is a more appropriate alternative in general where you will show a cost of 3 lakhs out of which 2 lakh is met by the government grant and hence 1 lakh is to be shown as a net cost. So, either of these two presentations can be done for grants linked to income. Okay. Next, you go to index 116. This is on leases. Over here, the accounting is asked in the books of the lesser when there is an operating lease. Whenever there is an operating lease, the accounting has to be done on a straight line basis or another systematic basis if there is more evident. So, sometimes what might happen is there are lease incentives or payments which are made by the lesser to the lessee. Usually, lessee pays to the lesser, but if the payments are made by the lesser to the lessee, that is called as a lease incentive, then in such cases, you will have to. Uh, you will have to find a straight line rent that is the rent per annum unless there is a systematic basis which is other than straight line basis. Okay. So, let us read this. 
how will entity y account for the incentive in the following scenario so this is for entity y who is entity y entity y in scenario a is a lesser enters into an operating lease of the property with entity x who is a lessee for a five year term so lease term is five years at a monthly rental of one lakh ten thousand okay that is a monthly rental in order to induce entity x to enter into the lease y provides six lakhs to entity x at lease commencement for lease improvements that is lazy assets so these are lazy assets so what will happen if i had to find the rent per annum in such case i would say i have to i will receive one lakh ten thousand over five years that is 60 month i will receive one lakh ten thousand over five years i guess this is a monthly payment okay over 60 months but i will pay 6 lakhs i will pay 6 lakhs and as a result my rent per annum should be or rent per month should be 1 lakh 10000 into 60 that is 66 lakhs minus 6 lakhs because that is what i am paying that is 60 lakhs divided by 60 comes to 1 lakh per month and as a result Ideally, in scenario A, if I have to pass the journal entry at month 0, at month 0, my entry will be, I will pay, so this is deferred rent account debit, I will pay, so I will pay 6 lakhs to bank, let us say 6 lakhs. Now, in each year, had I not made, or in each month, had I not made this payment, my income would have been 1 lakh 10,000. Now, my income is actually 10,000 less so this is on month one my entry will be bank account debit let us say 1.1 lakhs to rental income what will be the rental income that will go to the profit and loss account one lakh where will the balance go well this will be credited from the deferred rent you must have created a deferred rent which is 0.1 which is a balancing figure so over here your rental income we have said is going to be 1 lakh per month but you have received 1.1 so the balance 0.1 will be taken out of deferred rent Achha, this is taken 10,000 in the first month where it old 60 months are there and hence 60,000 effectively or 6 lakhs effectively over the entire 60 month period will be adjusted so this is how you will do the straight lining so basically you can say 6 lakh which is your deferred rent or lease incentives will effectively be spread over a 60 month period and hence 10,000 per month will be amortized in each of these months. Scenario B, the less entity Y who is a lesser enters into an operating lease for the property with entity X who is a lessee for a five year term. Again, same with the monthly rental of 1,10,000, everything seems to be the same. At lease commencement, entity Y provides 6 lakh rupees to entity x okay again it seems to be an incentive for leasehold improvements which will be achha, emphasis on this which will be owned by entity y that is these are lesser assets this is the only point of difference these are lesser assets in which case is it actually a lease incentive no i'm just providing you money so that you construct something which is actually my asset so hence that six lakh rupees will not be treated as a lease incentive in fact it is my pp it is my asset not the lessee's assets in the first case these were lessee's assets Lessee can take them, do whatever they want. Like AC, Vagara, Lessee can take. Now it is my asset. The estimated useful life of the leasehold improvements is, let us say, five years. So over here, what will happen in this case is your lease rent, your rent per month will still be one lakh ten thousand per month. Sir, what about that uh, six lakh rupees? That six lakh rupees will be property, plant, and equipment account debit six lakhs to bank six lakhs. Now. I am giving 6 lakhs to the lessee to construct my asset and hence this is 6 lakhs and this will get depreciated. So, in each of the years, depreciation account debit to PP, if the life is uh, 5 years, then 6 divided by 5, that is 1.2 per annum. So, this will be the entry. There will be no separate lease incentive working. You will have 1 lakh 10,000 per month. This 6 lakhs that is spent is for my asset. Okay, so that is about question number 10 a very specific case Achha, we have discussed about lease equalization or deferred rent in operating lease of lesser you can refer that guidance question 11 is very very basic uh, 
on in october 11 hil acquired 75 percent of very relevant by paying cash consideration of 80 so this is like pc the fair value of non-controlling interest as on the date is 0.2 so this is let us say nci at fair value and the value of very relevant identifiable net assets as per 103 is 1.1 million okay with respect to the acquisition of very relevant determine the value of gain on bargain purchase when nci is measured at fair value or proportionate net assets method so over here this is pc plus nci minus net assets pc over here is 0.8 if it is at fair value this is 0.2 and net assets are given as 1.1 and hence the difference between the two that is 0.1 is the gain on bargain purchase this is if nci is at fair value if nci is using proportionate net assets in which yes 0.8 is still the pc however the NCI will now be 1.1 into let us say 1.1 into what is the percent 25 percent. So net assets of 1.1 into 25 percent comes to 0.275 minus 1.1 and hence this will be what 0.8 plus 0.275 minus 1.1 and hence this is 0.025. So over here this is question number uh, 11 most of these questions you see are fairly easy this is 0 0.1 and 0 0.025 Achha. next you have question number 12 this is on index I think 41 if I am not wrong okay so this is on agricultural activities when is something considered to be an agricultural activity it is a particular activity is considered to be agricultural activity if an entity is engaged in managing biological transformation that is growth reproduction death etc it is engaged in biological transformation and harvest in order to generate either additional biological assets or holding the biological assets for sale or holding the biological assets to convert into agricultural produce so basically there are two main pillars first you have to manage biological transformation and harvest in order to have the biological assets for sale or for the purpose of additional biological assets or converting them into agricultural produce take fisheries limited practices pisciculture so this is like managing fish in sweet water so it's not salty water so it's not like oceans etc in sweet waters like ponds tanks dams etc so this is not salty water the fishing activity of fisheries in such sweet water consists of only catching the fish that's it so it is not managing the biological transformation it is not maintaining the fish it is not rearing them not breeding them it is just going in those sweet waters and fishing out so it is just doing harvest it is converting the fish uh, which is a biological asset into an agricultural produce for the purpose of selling however it is not managing biological transformation so comment whether such activity will be covered within the scope of 41 the answer is no because there is no management of biological transformation and hence this is not an agricultural activity fish that is kind of extracted will directly be taken under index 2 inventory Achha, for a change in this RTP the financial instrument questions are fairly basic questions usually financial instrument questions are a little challenging here there is index 32 which is on definition of financial asset and financial liability we'll quickly refer that question number 13 state whether the following items meet the definition of financial assets or financial liability of an entity so let us read each of them a bank advances an entity a five-year loan this is a financial liability for the entity the bank also provides an entity with an overdraft facility for a number of years this is also a financial liability to the extent the facility is utilized because in both cases there's a contractual obligation to deliver cash and hence there is a financial liability entity a owns preference shares in entity b okay so we are owning preference shares the preference shares entitle entity a to dividends but not to any voting rights so over here for entity a this is definitely a financial asset for entity b it can be a financial liability or equity as the case maybe your compound financial instrument depending on the nature of preference share however it is a financial asset for entity a for sure an entity is a present obligation in respect of income tax due during the previous year this is not a financial liability because it is a statutory obligation to deliver cash covered by the exceptions in a lawsuit brought against the entity 
a group of people is seeking compensation for damage to their health as a result of land contamination believed to be caused by waste from entity's production process. Okay, it is unclear whether the entity is the source of the contamination since many entities operate in the same area and operate similar products. So, this is also not a financial liability, it can be a liability. It can be a provision or a contingency which will be as per index 37. However, there is no contractual obligation to deliver cash as per the contract between the there is no contact between the entity and the protesting people and as a result it is not a financial liability. So most of these questions the moment you completed with the borrowing cost question from question number 7 all the way up to question number 13 I would not really put a lot of weight behind them they are quite basic questions. Then comes question number 14 which is again something that you should mark as important specifically because there is a word which the institute has used from the international context like treasury shares. Treasury shares are very common in the US. In India you do not generally have treasury shares except for certain exceptions. You generally don't have treasury shares. What are treasury shares? Typically when you buy back the shares you need to cancel them within a period of seven days at least in the Indian context. In certain cases in India or in US where you are permitted you can hold back these shares and not cancel them. So at a later date when you have to issue them to someone let us say for the purpose of settlement or for a new issue you can directly issue those shares without going ahead with fresh issue formalities and hence treasury shares are basically shares bought back. So if there were 100 shares out of which 20 have been bought back and cancelled then the outstanding shares are 80 only. However, if 100 shares are issued out of which 20 shares have been bought back but not cancelled at the end of the day the outstanding shares is still 80 shares only. So what you just have to remember is treasury shares are to be treated as shares which have been bought back and hence your total workings have to happen on the number of shares net of the treasury shares outstanding that is it you have to do the working for the number of shares net of the treasury shares outstanding that's it if you get uh, get over that concept this is a fairly basic problem so this is question number 14 company p has both ordinary shares okay so that is equity shares and equity classified preference shares okay so these are preference shares which are in the nature of equity remember they are still not equity shares they are in the nature of equity, we will show them as other equity. EPS is calculated per ordinary share or per equity share. An equity classified preference shares in issue, okay. So they are classified as equity and as a result, if there is any payment made to them, that would directly have gone against the return earnings. So your net profit given in the question would be before deducting preference dividend, if those preference shares were in the nature of financial liabilities, in which case the preference dividend paid to them would be subtracted within finance cost and hence your net profit will already be after preference dividend. However, if these preference shares are classified as equity, then the preference dividend is not deducted from the finance cost because it is equity in nature. Though you want to find EPS that is earning per equity share which means they will get the money after these preference shares have been paid off and hence you will have to subtract them separately. Take the reconciliation of the number of shares during year 1 is set out below. On 1st April, you had 30 lakh ordinary shares and 5 lakh treasury shares which means 5 lakh shares have already been bought back but they have not been cancelled and as a result the net shares will be 25 lakh shares. Ideally, those 5 lakh shares would have been cancelled in which case your net shares outstanding in issue will be 25 lakhs only. Here they have just been bought back just that they have not been cancelled but they are held by the company only. A bonus issue is 5%, no corresponding change in resources. What does bonus tell you in index 33? Index 33 says bonus issue has to be retrospectively adjusted from the earliest reporting date. So bonus is happening on 15th April, it does not matter that it is happening on 15th April or 30th April or uh, 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 let us say 10th April. We will consider bonus shares to be in existence from the earliest report date bonus is at 5%. So technically 30 lakhs into 5% will come to 1 lakh 50. However, are 30 lakh shares outstanding? No, out of 30 lakh shares, 5 lakhs have, have been bought back. So 5 lakhs into 5% if you go to see that is 25,000. These are bonus shares on treasury shares which are not held by the public at large and hence to the shares which are held by the public at large which is 25 lakh shares 
on that the bonus is basically 25 lakhs into 5% will come to 1,25,000. So, this is let us say 1,25,000. So, if I go to see the bonus shares are 1,25,000 and bonus shares have to be adjusted from the earliest reported date. So, this will be considered to be in existence from 1st of April itself. Achha, on 1st May, there is some repurchase of shares for cash. So, you repurchase shares and again kept them into the treasury shares. No, but shares have been repurchased. Then the number of shares outstanding are reduced and shares issued for cash actual 4 lakh shares so this will help you in calculating the weighted average number of equity shares so if i had to calculate let us say the weighted average number of equity shares i will calculate that as let us say uh 25 the various ways in which you can do all of them will give you the same answer 25 lakh shares which will be outstanding for the entire 12 months plus the net 1,25,000 shares, both of these are net of the treasury shares. So, over here, this is 30 minus 5 or this is 1.5 minus 0.25. Either of the case, you take the actual shares, which are also for the entire 12 months. Sir, it should be actually 11 and a half months. No, bonus shares are to be included from the earliest report dated and hence the entire 12 months. Then there are 2 lakh shares which are bought back. Whether they are kept in treasury shares or cancelled, it does not really matter. They have been bought back and hence that will reduce. So, this is 2 lakhs. When have they been bought back? Well, they will be bought back in 1st May and hence minus 11 by 12. We believe that 25 lakhs is there for the entire 12 months. No, out of that 2 lakhs have been bought back on 1st May and hence you subtract uh, into 11 by 12. So, this is you are trying to find the weighted average number of equity shares. This is for question number I think ye kya hai? Uh, 14. So, this is question number 14. So, and then there are further new shares. Achha, new shares is after the bonus issue and hence they will not be eligible to any further bonus shares. So, over here, just a second. I will just manage the space a little. So, over here, my plus 4 lakhs. They are issued on 1st November and hence 5 months till 31st March. So, if we do the working, this is what? 25 lakhs, 1 lakh 25,000 into 12 by 12, 2 lakhs into 11 by 12 m minus and 4 lakhs into 5 by 12 m plus mrc so this is around 26 lakh 8333 an alternative method can be to divide the year into various parts where i can say 25 lakhs plus 1 lakh 25 that is 26 lakh 25000 shares are outstanding for one month till may after which 2 lakh shares are bought back so this is 24 lakh 25000 remember you will have to take the bonus shares from the earliest date so you take 25 plus 1 lakh 25000 then 2 lakh shares are to be bought back on may so may june july august september october for 6 months and then 4 lakh new shares are issued so that is 28 lakh 25000 outstanding for the remaining 5 months so, if you do this working as well, hopefully you should be getting the same answer. So, this is 26, 25. Institute has done the second method, I guess, over here. Uh, then 24, 25 into 6 by 12 and then 28, 25 into 5 by 12. So, if I total up perfect, I get the same 26 lakh 8,333. Just assume or consider treasury shares to be the shares that have been bought back and you are sorted. The following additional information is relevant for year 1. Company P's net profit for the year is 46 lakh. Achha, is it before preference dividend or after? Well, this is before preference dividend because preference dividend is classified as equity and hence payment to equity is always directly against the reserves or other equity. It is not uh, against net profit. On 15th of February, that is during the year, non-cumulative preference dividend of 1.2 per share was declared. The dividend were paid on 15th of March. Preference shares do not participate in additional dividends with ordinary shares. So, how much will be the dividend? 5 lakh into 1.2, which will come to, I guess, 6 lakhs. So, this is your preference dividend. Dividends on non-cumulative preference shares are deductible for tax purposes. Now, this is fairly rare. Usually, if nothing is given, preference dividend is not tax deductible. The question tells you it is tax deductible. And in the applicable tax rate is 30%. So, yes, I have shown 46 lakhs as my profit. However, there is a 6 lakh preference dividend which is not considered. So, that 6 lakhs will reduce my profit. However, that 6 lakhs is deductible for tax purposes and hence that will give me some tax savings. And hence you can take the working as 6 lakhs into 1 minus 0.0 or you can take 6 lakhs less and then the tax savings on the 6 lakhs can be separately added. So, over here your profit 
your profit for ordinary shareholders or equity shareholders not all equity items equity shareholders in particular will be 46 lakhs minus 6 lakhs of preference dividend plus the tax savings that is 6 lakhs will give you tax savings to the extent of 30 percent so had i not had any preference dividend then my profit would be 46 lakhs but because of preference dividend my profits will fall by 6 lakhs but at the same time assuming these tax savings have not been considered separately uh, that is what institute has assumed you can also have an alternative assumption in which case this will come to i think 41 lakh 80000 therefore if i had to calculate the basic eps over here these are not convertible preferences so if you had to calculate the basic eps this is 41 lakh 80 divided by 26 lakh 8333 so this is 41 lakh 80 divided by 26 8 lakh 333 will come to approximately rupees 1.60 this is your basic eps is a question asking you to calculate basic or diluted the company's financial year end is 31st march determine the basic eps of the company for year one which is 1.60 i guess use the number of months or part of months rather than number of days in the calculation in any case we have taken the number of months only Achha. Next, you have index 8 question. This is similar to an earlier past RTP question, which has also been incorporated as a part of your study material. So, over here, what has happened is there is a defect which was which was hidden and could not be detected as on the balance sheet date, and it was detected later. So, can this defect be considered to be an error? Can the act of not being able to detect this defect as on the balance sheet did be considered as an error if it can be then you will have to retrospectively restate the previous year's financials or if the defect was such which cannot be detected by reasonable observation it is not an error and hence in such cases effect will have to be given on the prospective basis so we have discussed this uh, as well but i'll just quickly glance through it for uh, the sake of completion in the year let's say 13 14 after the entities 31st march 13 annual financial statements after the financial statements were approved for issue a latent defect in the composition of a new product manufactured by the entity was discovered that is a defect that was not discoverable by reasonable or customary inspection so this was a defect which could not have been detected by reasonable inspection as a result of the latent defect the entity incurred 1 lakh rupees in unanticipated cost for fulfilling its warranty obligations in respect of sales which were made before 31st March 2013 and hence one can say that should the provision for warranty for the year 12-13 which has already been finalized should that be altered the answer in my opinion is no because this was a defect which could not have been deducted and hence this is not an error in fact the moment it is detected you can create a provision in the year 13-14 that is in the next year an additional 20,000 was incurred to rectify the latent defect in the products sold during the year 13-14. So, that should be recorded in the year 13-14 only because those products were not even sold in the year 12-13. Before the defect was detected and the production process rectified, 5,000 of this relates to items in inventory at 31st March 13. The defective inventory was reported at cost, that is 15,000 in the financial statements of the year 12-13 when the selling price less cost to complete was estimated as 18. So, you compared 15 and 18, select whichever is lower, that is 15,000. Okay, however, 5000 was spent to rectify this defect. Now, ideally, NRV is est calculated as estimated selling price, that is 18,000 minus estimated cost to sell, that is another 5000, and hence it should ideally have been 13,000, and hence 2000 should have been the write off. However, as on the balance sheet date and even in the post balance sheet period, we were not able to detect the existence of this defect, and hence we will not treat this as an error. Whatever with the write off will be recorded in the year 13 14 only. The accounting estimates made in preparing the 31st March 13 financial statements in the 31st March 13 financial statements were appropriately made using all the reliable information that the entity could reasonably be expected to have obtained and taken into account for the preparation and presentation of financial statements which means this harps on the fact that there was no error. Whatever is happening is a change in estimate. Analyze the above situation in accordance with index 8. Basically, there will be no effect in the year, let's say, 12-13. The question does not mention anything about the post-balance sheet period. Yes, if this latent defect was detected during the post-balance sheet period, we would have treated this as an adjusting event and we would have adjusted the provision by increasing it by 1 lakh and we would have adjusted the inventory by showing a write-off for 2000. However, there's nothing about the post balance sheet period and hence we are assuming that this is 
uh, uh, I mean, in fact, it is clearly given over here that it is after the post parachute period were approved for issue. This is after these were approved for issue and hence we don't give the effect of the post balance sheet period. In the year 13-14, there will be additional provision for warranty to the extent of 1 lakh as well as 20,000 and a write-off if required for the inventory. All of this will be recorded in the year 13-14. There will be no effect in the year 12-13. So, that is question number 15. Achha, next, you go to question number 16, a very basic question. In an arm's length, that is fair transaction, entity X buys 10,000 convertible preferences in company Z for a cash payment of 40,000. Okay, so your entry should ideally be your buying. So, this is investment in convertible preferences account debit to bank. Okay, sir, convertible compound financial instrument, it is compound financial instrument in the books of the issuer. You are in the books of the holder. With 25,000 payable immediately, and 15,000 payable in two years. Achha, so, the value today will be the present value of future cash flows. The market rate of annual interest for a two year loan would be 6%. Explain the accounting treatment for the set transaction. So, when I look at the accounting treatment for the set transaction, your investment in preference shares today will be calculated as 25,000, which is paid today, plus 40,000, which will be at the present value so this is 25000 plus let us say 40000 25000 let us say plus 40000 into let's say 1 divided by 1.06 equals to equals to this is 0.88999 or 0.8900 so this is 40000 into point sorry 20 uh, what am i writing this is 15000 and 15000 payable later so this is 25000 payable images 25000 into 1 plus 15000 into 0.89 plus 25000 and hence this is 38000 350 so your entry today would be investment in convertible preference shares account debit 38350 to bank 25000 to let us say payable 13,350. Then that payable of 13,350 will slowly be amortized. You will record interest at 13,350 into 6%. That is approximately 800 or 801 in the first year. And then 13,350 plus 801 into another 6%. That is around uh, 1,500. 15,000 will be recorded as your total payable which will be paid off so just to be clear your entry will be investment account debit 38350 to bank 25000 to payable 13350 then in year 1 finance cost account debit to payable at the rate 6% in year 2 again finance cost account debit to payable again at 6% and then your payable will become 15000 you will pay it at the end of the second year payable account debit to bank let us say 15000 Okay, so this is about question number 16. Next, you have question number 17. This is for financial guarantee. A similar sum for financial guarantee was asked in a recent exam as well, which was there on the RTP as well. And hence we have, I mean, we have even put a separate video for financial guarantee on YouTube. You can refer to that. This is a slightly different question. Usually, in case of financial guarantee, there are three parties. There is the party who is taking the borrowing called as a principal debtor. There's a party who's giving the borrowing, who is the creditor or the lender as the case may be, and the party who is giving the guarantee, which is called as the surety or uh, the guarantor. In this particular question, the accounting is asked in the books of uh, uh, in the books of SEL, who is a borrower. So the person who gives the guarantee should ideally receive guarantee commission and if he is not receiving the guarantee commission like the question which has come in the exam and the rtp question for which we put the video you have to show that it is an off market transaction and hence you can show an investment sometimes it happens in case of a subsidiary this is in the books of the guarantor this is in the books of the surety because in the books of the surety there is a financial liability there is a contractual obligation to deliver cash that is if the principal debtor defaults the surety or the guarantor will have to pay money to the creditor and hence in the books of the guarantor or in the books of the surety 
you will have to show financial guarantee and account for that using FETPL principles and ensure that the loss provision if any is created. However, if you are in the books of the borrower, you have the liability to pay to the bank. That is it. So you have already recorded that liability. Then if someone has given a guarantee on your borrowing, that is not a financial liability for you. And as a result, there is no separate working that is going to come in the books of the entity who for whom guarantee is given. Remember the guarantee is given by the guarantor to the bank from which we have taken the borrowings. So we have an obligation to pay to the bank and that will be shown as a financial liability. However, if someone has given a guarantee on my behalf, that is not a financial liability for me. It is a financial liability for the guarantor. Achha. So we'll just read that if that guarantee is given by the way by a related party like a director who is a key managerial personnel, then we will have to give disclosure in the related party report. That is it, but nothing beyond that. So SCL has applied for a term loan from the bank for business purposes. Take so SCL has applied. So for SCL, this term loan will be a financial liability if it takes that loan. There's a contractual obligation to deliver cash. As per the loan agreement, the loan required a personal guarantee of one of the directors of SEL to be executed. So this is a guarantee which should be given by the director to the bank. In case of default by SEL, the director will be required to compensate for the loss that the bank incurs. Okay, Mr. Pure Joy, who is one of the directors, said given the guarantee to the bank pursuant to which the loan was sanctioned to SEL. SEL does not pay any premium or fees to the director for providing this financial guarantee. So there is no separate transaction in the books of SEL on account of that guarantee. Whether SEL is required to account for the financial guarantee received from its director, the answer is no. It is not a financial liability. Basically, it is not a financial liability. It is not even a financial asset for SEL. It does not get a contractual right to receive anything. It does not have a contractual obligation to pay anything to the director. And hence, it is not a financial liability, not a financial asset. And hence, it is not to be separately recorded. In the books of the director, I mean director as an individual, index will not be applicable. However, if instead of director, if this was let us say a holding company who had given this guarantee, then in the books of the holding company, you will figure out whether this guarantee is at fair terms, should there be any guarantee commission, uh, is that guarantee commission paid, if not, there is an investment in the subsidiary hidden. So it was a different problem in, uh, uh, in that case here, the accounting is in the books of the borrower. So in the books of borrower, you will just show the loan taken from the bank as a financial liability. That's it. Guarantee will have no separate accounting implications. Will there be any disclosure under Indus 24? Yes, since the guarantee is given by the director who is a key managerial personnel, transactions and outstanding balances, if any, will have to be shown on account of this related party transaction. Whether it appears in the balance sheet or not, it does not really matter. You show this irrespective of whether it appears in the balance sheet separately or not. Okay, next you go to question number 18. This is for index 38 along with index 103. As per index 103, you should take over all assets and all liabilities which are identifiable at their fair value at the time of acquisition. Identifiable assets would mean assets which are separable. That is, they are capable of being separated out and sold separately or assets which give a contractual license or a right. If they are separately identifiable, then at the stage of acquisition, you will have to record them separately, separate from goodwill. Like you have recorded brand, for example, in question number one of the RTP. An entity acquired two trade secrets, that is secret recipes in a business combination. Recipe A is patented and recipe B is not yet legally protected. Achha, recipe A is patented, which means it is separately identifiable. How do I say that it is separately identifiable? Maybe the target has recorded separately or it does not, uh, not, it does not really matter. The acquirer will have to record it separately at the fair value. It is identifiable because it is a contractual right or a license that I have. In all likelihood, it is separable as well. You can separate out and sell it separately as well. Recipe B is not legally protected. It may not be legally protected. So basically, there is no license as such. However, it is still separable. You can sell recipe B to someone who wants that recipe irrespective of selling the entire business and hence it is still separable. And if it is separable, it is still considered to be identifiable. Okay. So at the stage of business combination, will the fair value of recipe A as well as the fair value of recipe B be recorded separately as identifiable asset? The answer is yes. How is the acquisition of recipe A? and recipe B to be accounted for by the entity as per the relevant index, it will be recorded as separately identifiable assets. So recorded as 
separate assets both of them will be recorded as separate assets at their respective fair values because they are identifiable okay now question number 19 is more of a theory based presentation question it is on interim reporting so if i were to prepare an interim report what do i have to prepare i can either prepare condensed financial statements or complete financial statements the question asks you what are the comparatives to be shown that is it so over here question number 19 the entity's financial year ends on 31st of march okay what are the reporting periods for which financial statements that is condensed or complete in the interim financial report of the entity as on 30, 30th september 11 are required to be presented if the entity publishes interim reports quarterly second entity publishes interim report on a half yearly basis so over here what does the standard mention standard mentions that your financial statements comprises of what your financial statements comprises of the balance sheet it comprises of the statement of profit and loss it comprises of statement of changes in equity soce and it comprises of the cash flow statement cfs over here in case of an interim report for the balance sheet what is asked well balance sheet you have to show the balance sheet which is on 30th september for example this is given as 30th september 2011 so let us say this is 30th september 11 you have to show this balance sheet along with this you have to show the balance sheet of the last annual financial statement so as a result along with that you will show the 31st march 2011 balance sheet in the statement of changes in pnl the first part asks you if the entity publishes interim reports quarterly so if i have to prepare quarterly reports i will have to show the current quarter's performance and the comparative previous quarter's performance of the last year and then year to date performance along with the previous year to date performance so over here this is for the quarter or three months ended 30th september 2011 along with the three months corresponding ended on 30th september 2010 along with that it is ytd year to date ytd also called as year to date that is for the six month period that is from 1st april 2011 to 30th september 2011 and the corresponding previous year year to date ytd that is for six months that is 1st of April 2010 to 30th September 2010. For statement of changes in equity, you don't have to show quarterly performance. You will directly show the changes on a year to date basis only. So that is for six months on a year to date. That is 1st April 2011 to 30th September 2011 along with the comparable six month year to date working. So this is year to date, year to date. That is 1st April 2010. To 30th of september 2010 same is the case with the cash flow statement you have to show the six month that is a year to date workings only six month that is year to date workings only so this is if the company is preparing quarterly financials what if the company publishes interim financials half yearly well if it is publishing half yearly that means nothing is happening for three months it is happening for six months only balance sheet is never for three months or six months it is still dead so for balance sheet the working is still going to be the same if it is half yearly then i don't need to show this separately however i will still have to show the half yearly performance so i will still show this statement of changes in equity as well as the cash flow statement are still going to be shown on the six monthly basis so the only thing that i will not have to show is the three month performance for the profit and loss account so this is for previous year comparison it is more for theory i don't really think that questions like this though it is good for a practical understanding uh, will make it to the exam it is relatively less unlikely so this is regarding question number 19. Achha, next you go to question number 20. On 1st of January 2011. Now this is a question on index 105 which is exactly similar to a question which is there in your study material in our books as well as uh, in one of the recent RTBs taken from a GFRS paper. The numbers just have been modified a little over here. Uh, let us read this quickly. On 1st of January 2011 the carrying amount of the relevant assets of the division of an entity star limited were as follows this is on 1st of january 2011 purchase goodwill 1.2 lakhs pp with an average life of two years of four lakhs and inventory at two lakhs so if i want to find the total carrying value that is 1.2 and 4 and 2 this is 7.2 this is your carrying value on 1st january from 1st january star began to actively market the division and received a number of serious inquiries so this is the entire division and hence this can be like a discontinued operation as well 
On 1st January, the directors estimated they would receive 6.4 lakhs from the sale of the division. Ajah, so this is your carrying value. You compare with the fair value, assuming there is no cost to sell, which is 6.4, and hence there will be an impairment or a write off under index 105 to the extent of the difference between the two 7.2 minus 6.4 comes to 0.8. This 0.8 will first be adjusted against goodwill, and hence the entire 0.8 is adjusted against goodwill. So this is 1.2 minus 0.8. So this is coming to 0.4. Your remaining goodwill will be 0.4. Since 1st January, market conditions have improved and on 30th of April, Star received and accepted a firm offer to purchase the division for 6.6 .6 lakhs. The sale is expected to be completed by 30th June. Okay, 6.6 .6 lakhs can be assumed to be a reasonable estimate of the value of the division on 31st March 11. So over here, we did the working on 1st of January 11, then on 31st March 11. So on 1st January 11, your carrying value, if you go to see on 1st January 11, just a second, your carrying value. We have already done this calculation earlier was 7.2. You compared it with the fair value, less cost to sell, which was 6.4. And hence, there was an impairment to the extent of 0.8, which was written off against the goodwill. So, 0.8 was adjusted against the goodwill and the goodwill became 0.4. Now, if I want to calculate the carrying value on 31st March again, during the period 1st January to 31st March, for 3 months, will there be any depreciation? No. The assets are classified as held for sale and hence depreciation stops. Inventories of the division costing 1.6 lakhs were sold for 2.4 lakhs. And as in 31st March 2011, the total cost of the inventories of the division was 1.8 lakhs. All of these inventories have an estimated NRV which is in excess of their cost. So, if I want to calculate the NRV, the goodwill over here will come to 0.4. The PPE, there will be no further depreciation because the assets are classified as held for sale. So, PPE will be 4 and your inventory will be 1.8. And hence, this is 0.4 plus 4 plus 1.8 comes to 6.2. And your estimated selling price is 6.6. The question tells you 6.6 .6 can be taken as a reasonable estimate and hence there is no impairment. In fact, there is a reversal. The reversal over here is 0.4. However, can you reverse impairment on goodwill? No. There is no reversal possible because goodwill impairment cannot be reversed. Cannot be reversed and hence there will be no reversal done over here. Explain the disclosure requirement relating to the sale of the division and provide the accounting treatment of the property held for sale and the discontinued operations. So, over here, from 1st of January 2011 to 31st March 2011, whatever is the profit, let us assume the profit on this transaction is, you have, let us say, you have sold for, uh, uh, one po uh, you have sold 2.4 minus 1.6, so 0.8 will be shown as a separate line item as discontinued operations under this standard and apart from that, there will be a write-off to the extent of 0.8 against goodwill, there will be no further reversal. In the balance sheet, the non-current assets will be, uh, the non-current asset disposal group as a case may be, in the balance sheet, they will be shown as a separate line item. So, that finally takes care of all the questions in your RTP for May 23. I hope this has been helpful. Now, at the beginning of this RTP, there is also some amendments. Now, the word amendment always kind of creates some level of discomfort or not discomfort, but some level of uncertainty on how will that impact our solutions. Over here, the amendments can be classified into two categories. The amendments can be those linked to CSR corporate social responsibility. Now, in my opinion, these amendments which are linked to CSR are by and large linked to law. For theory perspective, you should be aware. For an overall knowledge and comfort perspective, also you need to be aware, but that is not going to materially change your working. So, this is on corporate social responsibility, that is CSR, which is due to a notification which was issued to amend on 30th of, on I think 20 or 22nd of September 2020-22. So, this is on in line with the notification issued for certain amendments. And then there is certain amendments to IND AS which are same as those specified in the November 2022 RTP. We have put a separate video on that as well. You can refer that having said that they don't have any meaningful, I mean they don't have any meaningful or very uh, path breaking 
changes some changes you should know which have already been done and incorporated you can refer that we'll share the link of that video as well so we are going to in this video discuss about the changes which are there in the csr provisions keeping aside the indes amendments the minor amendments in indes which were done earlier in the november rtp uh, you can refer that in that separate short 5 uh, 10 or odd minute video which we had earlier shared uh, you can refer that Achha. now we are looking at the csr so in csr what has been told earlier if a company falls under section 135 1 of the csr provisions that is its let us say net worth is greater than or equal to or your turnover is greater than or equal to or net profit is equal to the specified limits whatever those uh, 200000 crore or 5 crore limits are then it will fall under csr provided these limits are exceeded in the immediately preceding year and if it falls under csr ideally it should constitute a csr committee it has to spend an 2% of the average net profits for csr activities which are specified in schedule 7 and a disclosure should be given in the directors or in the annual report now there was an amendment which had come on the on the constitution of the csr committee that the csr committee is now required only for those companies which have the csr spending which is greater than 50 lakhs however this amendment says that still you will have to create csr committee for only those companies whose csr spending is greater than 50 lakhs additionally if you have any money outstanding in the unspent csr account remember csr provisions allow you to spend two percent of the average net profit in each year but if you are unable to spend then within six months you have to contribute it to a csr fund or if you have an ongoing project you can keep it for a period of three years in an unspent csr account so over here if I look at the CSR based amendments, I can say that, okay, the first amendment over here is the constitution of a CSR committee. Earlier, for every company which is falling under CSR, you had to create a CSR committee, then it got amendment amended and only those companies which are having a CSR spending of greater than 50 lakhs will have to constitute a committee, which is still the spend. So, CSR spend should be greater than or equal to 50 lakhs which is still there however additionally over and above this if any balance exists in the unspent csr account then irrespective of whether it is 5 lakhs 10 lakhs 15 lakhs it does not really matter then irrespective of that a csr committee needs to be constituted so this is the first amendment not very important to be honest from a sum solving perspective now there is a second amendment which there is a lot of debate and disconnect even if you see within the legal fraternity on the interpretation of that so pending the clarification of the institute we will just remember what this amendment is but again we await clarification from ICI or relevant legal authorities so over here there is a rule 3 sub point 2 which can potentially have an impact on your solutions rule 3 2 is now omitted now what was rule 3 2 mentioning rule 3 2 was mentioning that if a company if a company does not so rule 3 2 used to mention this was on non applicability the rule 3 2 was on non applicability it used to mention that if a company does not fulfill does not fulfill csr provisions does not fulfill csr provisions in immediately preceding three financial years immediately preceding three financial years then it need not then it need not so there is no csr committee required and there is no 2% spending etc required so this rule has been omitted now how do you interpret the omission of this rule 
one school of thought is this rule is omitted because earlier it was told and this is all legal opinions if you see online you search up on google for legal opinions there are different people having given different interpretations to be honest we are not very uh, legal experts so we will await clarity from legal experts or from the ICI as a case may be so one interpretation over here is since now CSR committee need not be created only for those companies to which CSR is applicable in the current year even if you have balance in the unspent CSR account even if you have balance in the uns unspent CSR account irrespective of everything everything else you will still have to have the CSR committee and hence we are saying that no CSR committee if it is for the last three years no no you have to constitute CSR committee if there's any balance lying in the unspent CSR account irrespective of any kind of applicability that is one school of thought another which is a more common school of thought is which can impact your solutions is that since your initial application of CSR was based on provisions of the immediately preceding year. So there was a disconnect your initial application of CSR for the first time was based on the provisions in the immediately preceding year only. However, if you have to move out of CSR, then you have to look at the immediately preceding three financial years. Now, this is kind of disconnecting and it kind of defies the provisions for just looking at the immediately preceding year. And hence, an interpretation of this can also be that the fact that this, this rule 3.2 is omitted, that means for every year, you only need to look at the immediately preceding financial year. You don't have to look at the immediately preceding three financial years at all. Ideally, this should be the interpretation which should be given in my opinion. But again, uh, you can even consult your law faculties. They will be in a much more better position to guide on this. But ideally, this should be the overall impact of this omission where you can say that for the initial application, you looked at only the immediately preceding financial year. But for moving out of CSR, you looked at the immediately preceding three financial years. Now, this was internally inconsistent and hence the omission of this provision, which required you to compare, uh, look at the immediately three uh, financial years. The fact that this provision has been omitted, that means for each year, you look at the immediately preceding financial year and decide whether CSR is applicable or not. So, it may be applicable in one of the years, then not applicable in the next year and then applicable in the third year, which is the interpretation which I would like to give to this omission. And the third interpretation, which is also online, which I don't think is the correct interpretation, is the fact that this uh, provision has been omitted. Then once CSR becomes applicable, it will always be applicable. That is definitely not the intention of this omission, that you remove this provision to make it applicable always. Section 135, subsection 1 still applies, which says that you will apply CSR if in the immediately preceding financial year, your limits are crossed. So there are three interpretations which are given. First, this is a removal only to facilitate uh, to cover the fact that CSR committee is now to be prepared not just if you are crossing the limits even if there is an announcement CSR you will create. Second is the more logical interpretation in my opinion where we look at initial applicability as well as subsequent non-applicability based on just the immediately preceding financial year. So if the limits are crossed in the immediately preceding financial year you follow CSR provisions. If they're not crossed in the immediately preceding financial, irrespective of what is happening in the earlier years, you do not uh, follow CSR provisions. So this is the interpretation which we would like to give. I will also try to upload a separate video once we get better clarity on this. And the third is CSR always becomes applicable, which I don't uh, think is the right interpretation. Aja. The third amendment over here is on allowing or broad basing the coverage to more CSR implementing agencies. So see, remember CSR activities are those activities which are given under schedule 7 to the companies act. Now these activities can be done by the entity itself or what the entity can do is it can contribute money to certain implementing agencies and these implementing agencies who are engaged in these noted schedule 7 activities if they spend that money they are they are registered entities which are going to spend the money for CSR activities only. So if rather than you don't have the time or the bandwidth to ar arrange a CSR program, there is an NGO for example or there is a uh, uh, there is an approved entity whose core objective is to spend money in items which are covered by Schedule 7. Then if you contribute money to that organization, then it is considered to be 
a discharge of your CSR provisions as well. Now the scope of that implementing agencies so the scope of implementing agencies have been widened again it is not of more of an accounting aspect it is more of a legal aspect but scope of implementing agencies have been widened implementing agencies widened which means now even religious or charitable institutions or educational institutions or hospitals which are not for the purpose of profit usually this implementing agencies will now include will also include over here what will it, what will it also include it will include religious charitable educational institutions or medical or hospitals as a case may be which are not which are not for the purpose of profit and which are considered as exempted contributions to these are concept or income from these are considered to be exempted under section 10 of the income tax act and they have been registered by the commissioner of income tax so there are so to these institutions even if you so in practical life this is a much more broader you don't have to now go searching for those eligible institutions now it is much more broader so you can contribute money to these institutions and that is considered to be discharge of the csr activities so this is about the scope of implementing agencies now apart from this so this is let's say separate now apart from this there is also something called as an impact assessment so all of these are legal provisions so the impact assessment it is like if you have done a csr program you want to assess whether the you want to assess that how has that impacted the general public or your intended audience and hence impact assessment is done remember impact assessment is done if your csr spending is to be greater than 10 crores so if in a particular financial year if your csr spending is greater than 10 crores then you need to do impact assessment of your CSR activities on whether they have affect they have affected the larger audience in what way have they affected and you can disclose the impact in your uh, uh, in your CSR report as well. So for which projects so you will have agencies which are going to do that impact assessment and which are the projects to which you do CSR impact assessment. Now, you might have done CSR spending of greater than 10 crores, but is it necessary that all the 10 crores is in one CSR activity only? No, you might have contributed some money for the purpose of building hospitals, some for education, some for conservation of uh, uh, environment, etc. In Hence, if on a project, on a project, the CSR spent on an individual project, if the CSR spend is greater than 1 crore, if the CSR spend is greater than 1 crore on an individual project, then after 1 year, then after 1 year, because the results will be shown after a year only or more, then you do a CSR impact assessment. In my opinion, this is more of a control measure where entities were trying to bypass CSR provisions by just contributing money to dummy entities and then saying that CSR work is done. So over here, if major expenses have been incurred behind projects, after a year or so, if the implement, if the impact assessment agencies see that nothing is changing, that means probably there is a hole and you have not, so it's more of a control measure to ensure that big spendings that have happened they are actual genuine spendings because you will have to appoint an agency which actually gives that assessment report and if you have not uh, in good faith spend that money then the agencies can probably highlight that so it's more of a control measure so over here this is csr spending of greater than one crore then after a year you will have to get the impact assessment done by impact assessment agencies now what about the money that is spent for the impact assessment can that also be csr well over here money spent money spent for impact assessment for impact assessment this will also be treated as eligible csr spending however limits have been revised over here for this eligible csr spending this is 
now the higher of maximum money higher of 2% of the csr spending or 50 lakhs whichever is higher so i think whichever is uh, just i'll just confirm whichever is lower higher i'll just Aja, such a company may book an expense uh, now the current as per the amendment the limit to book the expenditure for impact assessment has been reduced to two percent earlier five percent of total csr or 50 lakhs whichever is higher earlier which was lower so we have to remember uh, the provision whichever is higher which means if your total csr spent let us say was 15 crores i mean it was greater than 10 crores so 15 crores so 15 crores into 2 percent that comes to i think 0.3 crores or 30 lakhs so 30 lakhs or 50 lakhs whichever is higher maximum money maximum money that can be considered as eligible for impact assessment can be 50 lakhs so if you pay to an impact assessment agency 65 lakhs so that it does the impact assessment that 65 lakhs will not be considered as eligible csr activity maximum of 30 lakhs or 50 lakhs whichever is higher will be allowed as csr spending so this is what is mentioned so if you go to see just for your academic uh, completion so on 20th september there was a notification constitution of csr committee so an amendment is that a company that has any amount outstanding in the unspent CSR account should also constitute a CSR committee. Second, omission of rule to rule three two for which we need a little more clarity. And once that comes, I will share a video separately for the timing. You can just remember that this rule two is omitted. It will have one. It will just have impact on one question, which is there in your study material, which is there in your test your knowledge. I think question one or two which is also there in our books i think question two or so so it will there be just one question where there is an impact otherwise everything else remains the same rule three two required that every company that ceases to fulfill the criteria prescribed by section 135 uh, for three consecutive years is not required to constitute a csr committee now as per the amendment rule three two uh, has been omitted so probably the interpretation can also be that this is because csr committee is not just now required by companies who are fulfilling csr obligation uh, or meeting within limits but also a person even if their spending is less than 50 lakhs if the unspent csr account is there or it can be interpreted that the provisions of initial applicability and non-applicability now go line in line so over here this is the interpretation inclusion of list of entities that can be engaged as implementation agencies various other institutions for charitable purpose uh, for uh, religious purpose educational institutions hospitals etc will be included if they have they are eligible institution that is they are exempted as per section 1023 or something of the income tax act along with uh, approval obtained change in the limit for expenses as we said the limit of expenses now is two percent of the total csr spending total not just uh, covered by impact assessment report total csr spending that is 15 crores in our example or 50 lakhs whichever is higher and there is also an amendment which is on uh, which is revising the disclosure requirement so over here the disclosure of csr report has been a little more aligned now you have to give an executive summary of the csr work that is done in the annual report and web links have to be given where a reader if he wants to look at the detailed report he can click on the web links and go to the website where you have given a detailed disclosure earlier an amendment had come a couple of years back where you were required to show the money spent behind each csr activity now this was very cumbersome and hence the the amendment now is to show a total uh, csr activity so basically you have to give an executive summary along with relevant web links you have to now give detail about the total csr spend instead of giving details about the individual csr spending etc so there are a few other changes in disclosures which i would not really put a lot of weight behind uh, at least in your accounting so you have to show the executive summary the disclosure is now is to be done uh, on a total amount basis rather than an individual amount basis and additional disclosures to be given for unspent csr so over here i mean not uh, you can uh, this is just a summary so this is additional disclosure for unspent csr to be given that's it uh, other than that this is companies india's rules this is exactly same verbatim not even a comma changing same as november 2 2020 rtb it is just a reprint because the study material has not been printed again 
so i guess i mean for which we will share a video link separately we have uh, recorded a video i'm pretty sure you must have seen this and if not you can just go through that again so i hope this video has been helpful for your uh, for your uh, preparations if you have any comments or any uh, thing which you think we can share to make your preparation more uh, focused and meaningful or uh, uh, something that you need please do write in the comment box and uh, i'll see you soon with uh, some other videos till then study hard study well good luck goodbye take care